Amen. Glory to God. Thank you for joining me today. It's good to be here today. Today, we have a very practical message for you. The threefold renewal, heart, spirit, and mind. And I absolutely love everything about this message. I mean, number three is precious to God. The idea of renewal, there's a lot of re words in the Bible, renew, regenerate, recompense, which means to repay. You know, there's a lot of uh, these re words in the Bible. And the idea is that God has a reason why he does things. And so God being sovereign, he is in full control. And while we look around and say, wow, things look somewhat out of control to us sometimes, here God is saying, no, I have a plan. I'm sovereign. And you'll hear preachers often referencing, you know, the best life is the Christian life or, hey, you know what, get saved and be free from sin or live freely. And there's all these ideas about how living as a Christian should be better or is better than the world. And that is godly. That's God's plan. And that is the idea of this threefold renewal of the heart, spirit, and mind. God's an intelligent designer, one who made humans like us with the capacity to change for the better. We have the capacity to change for the better. God made us with the ability to be better than we are. Colossians 3.10 And have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. The idea here is the idea of putting on the new man. One that is strikingly different than the old man. And so what God does is he gives us an example of what the old man looks like. The sinful natural man in Adam. That's the idea of the Adamic nature, which just means your Adam nature, your Adam-like nature. Also referred to as the first Adam. Who's Adam? The first human God created. Who's Adam? He's the one with Eve that sinned. Amen. And Adam being the head of the household, it, that, that sin is to his charge first and foremost, and then to Eve. And so Adam is sinful. He's fleshly. He's of the world. He's enmity or at war with God because he fell into sin. And every person, whether they like it or not, has this Adamic nature when they're born. It's the idea of being born into sin. And some groups teach that that's not the case, that man isn't sinful. I think if you go to most uh, Baptist or fundamental type of um, mission statements or church doctrine, you'll read the idea of the depravity or depraved man, which is a total affront or offense to those that don't believe it, but it's the truth. Man is depraved, amen. You know, if you want to see uh, what a depraved man look looks like, just back one into the corner, okay? I mean, you look at, uh, you know, when the, the, the hurricane's coming and the bread aisle gets picked over or, or the milk is taken over. Remember, before COVID, they would have those Black Fridays and you, you know, I had the, the I guess the fortune or not fortune of going to a few of them. I know I didn't sleep overnight or anything, but you walk into a Best Buy or a Walmart and you could see depraved man first, just right on headlines, right in front of you. Amen. And they're running around like a lunatic and they're willing to stomp you in the throat to get what they want. Again, it's been documented. It's on it's on YouTube. I don't suggest you watch it, but the idea we all are depraved, even the most genteel and well-behaved and well-educated individual, uh, they are falling far short. They are of the Adamic nature. The Bible says there are none righteous, no, not one. Amen. We are not righteous. Even Jesus said the only one good is God. Amen. The only good that we have is what God gives us. And so the old man, we are to put off that old man and we are to put on this new man. And who's the new man? That's the last Adam. That's being Christ-like. The new man is holy, set apart of heaven and is reconciled to God. That means they're no longer at war with God. They are at peace with God. And so God's just painting this picture saying, look, you got the old man and the new man. You got the world and you got heaven. You've got sinful, the devil, and you've got God, right? Holy and perfect. God's helping us simple people like me understand that there is a need to renew ourselves, to get back 
to how we should be. And you say, Brother Clark, what, why would we renew ourselves if we're born in the sin? Well, Adam, when he was created, was not sinful. See, think about it. Adam sinned, and then sin took over. And it's something I learned, I think, a couple of years ago. Uh, his brother from the, the Ark, uh, who I, I really admire, um, he's got the creation ministries, uh, Ken Ham. He, he mentioned this, and I don't know if it was original to him or not in terms of the study, but he mentioned that before Adam, there was no death. And he said, that's one way to look at creationism is the idea of death entered the picture when Adam entered the pr- picture, which is how you can start to keep track of the time and so forth as a creationist. And that's what the Bible teaches. That's what I believe. Amen. And the idea is before Adam sinned, there was no death. So there was a time when Adam had not sinned. And the Garden of Eden was perfect. Life was perfect. There was no death. He was not to die ever. There was no such thing. Amen. And so the idea of renewal is getting back to that state as God had intended man to be. And the idea of renewal is to get our heart, our spirit, and our mind right with God. And you say, well, Brother Clark, why not the body? Well, we get a re, uh, the, the, we get the resurrected body, uh, at the rapture, amen, we, we shed this mortal body for the incorruptible. But until that time, the body's not part of it. The Bible talks about how uh, uh, physical exercise profiteth little. And, and I've heard uh, Brother Les Feldick say that that actually means like um, it only profits for a little while. So whether it's temporal or whether it just doesn't profit at all, I mean, in my experience, if you work out on Monday and you go to the buffet on Tuesday, whatever you did on Monday was offset by what you did on Tuesday. I could go on or made worse. But, you know, the point is physical exercise, our bodies, that's a renewal. That, that's another message. And we can and should treat our bodies as a temple and take care of our bodies. But, you know, we could eat the right food and we could live the right way and get enough sleep and do all these things. And our bodies are still in a, in a natural decline, decaying to a point of death. Amen. Unless the Lord comes and takes us home first, which is what my hope and prayer is. So we're really looking at the inside. We're looking at the heart, the spirit, and the mind. Amen. And I want you to think of, to put this in perspective, how the world looks at this. Think of two men running a race. And the first person is running in the wrong direction And they have no victory at all. And everybody's cheering them along saying, good job, you're doing great. And the second person is running in the right direction. They will have victory and reward, though everyone is telling them that they're running the race all wrong. That is what it's like to be a renewed Christian. You are doing what God calls you to do. And by virtue of doing what God calls you to do, you have victory now and reward to come. And because you're doing what God calls you to do, Many people in this broken and fallen world will say you're crazy. You know, woe unto them that call good evil and evil good, etc. That's another verse. But the idea is that this world is broken and fallen, and the vast majority of this world is lost on their way for, to a devil's hell. They have no idea what it's like to live for God. They have no idea these deeper things of God. And so when we have victory, it's going to look very odd to the world. But it doesn't make it less true. Again, two people running a race, one in the wrong direction, one in the right direction. The one that's going in the right direction is the winner, even if everybody doesn't like it. So God gives us three paths for renewal that I can see in the Bible for this life. And and this idea of renewal is, you know, very rich through the scriptures. And you could take this in a lot of directions. But from a very kind of overhead point of view, the threefold renewal is heart, spirit, and mind. And our text verse here is Psalm 5110. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. I love the Psalms. Absolutely love them. And I love this scripture because it is accurate. David is asking God to create in him a clean heart and renew a right spirit within him. So David, King David, knows who to ask to have his mind, his heart, his spirit renewed. Amen. So firstly, here the heart. 
And we know the heart, as we talk about here many times, the name of the ministry is Heartland Ministries. The heart is the deepest part of you. In Romans 10, it says, thou shalt believe with the heart and confess with the mouth. The heart is very important to God. And the heart doesn't symbolize the muscle, your heart, the muscle. It symbolizes the deepest part of you. And we are to renew the deepest part of us. We are to get back in right fellowship with God. Again, Psalm 51, 10, our text verse, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Now, if you have your Bible, turn to Ezekiel. Ezekiel 36, 26 through 27. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh, and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and ye shall keep my judgments and do them. And so we see in Ezekiel, this is the idea that as we turn to God, he takes away this hard heart of ours, and he puts this good, soft heart, this tender heart within us so that we could what? go out and live in sin, go out and profit ourselves, go out and make a name for ourselves? No, so that we could walk in his statutes, keep his judgments, and do them. And the idea of statutes and judgments, that's like commandments, that's his ways. People have gotten far off from this. They think like, hey, you know, we're in the age of grace. If I got saved, I can live however I want. That's not it at all. You know, God desires us to walk in his statute. Imagine the creator God. And again, this takes belief. It takes faith. And that, that's kind of the crux of the issue. But imagine a creator God that, cre- that, that creates you and then watches you get the benefit and walk away. How do you think that would make the creator feel? I mean, he engineered you to be a certain way. The heart of a natural man is deceitful and unable to care for what God wants us to care for. So the heart of the natural man will say, don't worry about other people. Worry about yourself. Don't worry about God, worry about yourself, on and on. It's not thy will, but my will. The heart of the born-again believer is soft to for what or to what God intends it to be. And soft hearts, I mean, this is, a, this is a really striking example. Think about it. Integrity. Soft hearts won't allow a lie to come out of your mouth. The cheating, the manipulating, all the things you see in the world today, if you have a soft heart towards God, you'll be convicted not to do those things. You could be brought to tears when you do them, repentant. I mean, I've heard people say, preachers, people in the ministry say, that when they sin, the Lord takes them to the woodshed. You know, that that they're convicted beyond convicted. Their heart is broken for that sin. So integrity... God desires us to have integrity. And there are examples both in the Old Testament and New Testament of that. I can think of one um, in both, one in the Old Testament when it deals with God commanding the scales to be right and accurate. You know, if you ever go to the grocery and weigh produce, that's how they used to buy and sell in old Bible times. They would use a scale. And clearly sinful man would rig the scale. So like if you were selling, say, uh, you know, barley, You would sell half as much for twice the price or whatever because your scale was so perverted. And God said, no, keep the scales right. Don't don't rip anyone off. And when you lend money, if you lend money to my people, don't charge them any interest. And there's all kinds of stuff. They get to the year of Jubilee. I mean, like you could have, you after seven years, if anyone owes you anything, they're relieved. I don't know why we don't have the year of Jubilee today. If we did, I, this, this person right here would be in Jubilee. But we don't do Jubilee anymore. But God, is in, he's got integrity. He wants people to act with integrity. You know, the New Testament, you see Jesus over and over and saying, lest I offend, lest I offend. He was doing all the things, you know, that, that, that he was, uh, tr- you know, asked to do so he wasn't offending people so he wasn't being accused of anything the idea of being b- blameless before god you know when it came to the town and they want him to pay taxes he, you know he said okay let's go get a penny out of the fish's mouth you know uh, on and on it, jesus showed integrity right a soft heart will show integrity how about love you know when the lord really softened my heart you know when i turned to the lord and i prayed for him to renew my heart you know i had a love for my family you know, soft hearts will be knit to the family. This is God's design for mankind. And I just had a much softer, and I, the way I'll put this, and I have a note, and I want to preach on this soon. The love 
is like the love of putting yourself in the other person's shoes. And you cannot do that, I don't believe, without a tender heart from God. So if I look at my kids and they're frustrated, instead of being the parent that wants them to just, you know, get right and do what they're supposed to do, I look from their eyes and see their frustration and maybe their feelings of doubt or insecurity, you know, or, or whoever it be, my wife or whoever. I see it from their eyes. A soft heart will be knit to their family. That's God's design for mankind. Conversely, if you have a hard heart, that's where divorce comes in because you start saying, oh, I'm right. And pride starts creeping up on all these things. And you have divorce or abuse. Again, I want my desires fulfilled. You know, I'm going to put them in their place. I, 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 me, me, me. That's the hard heart. The soft heart is that agape love, that sacrificial love, love for the brethren. A soft heart says, let's help the brothers and sisters in Christ. You know, when we see our brothers and sisters in Christ, we should look at them as a very special and precious group that God himself desires us to love on extra. If you read the Bible, there is, I mean, it's like there's a scripture that says something to the extent of, you know, love everyone, especially your brothers and sisters in Christ. It literally says that we need to love our brothers and sisters in Christ. And that soft heart, I mean, to the missionary that comes knocking on the door and you know, the church has no money, but you say, yeah, come on in and present, you know, and, oh, you know, let's see, well, I was going to spend this on whatever, but I'm going to give it to the missionary, you know, or the car wash, you know, the church has the car wash and they've got like one brush and one bucket of water with soap. You know what I'm talking about if you're in the ministry and you're like, oh, I was going to go to the robot car wash and have my car look at sparkly, but you know what? I'm going to go here. And even though it's three times as much, it's for a good cause, you know, it's youth camp or something. That's the point. Love for the brethren. And how about love for the broken, those that need Christ, the lost? You know, we are to weep over the lost. You know, Christ, he wept over the lost. He looked out upon them and they were scattered and they were ignorant. They were hopeless without him. And he wept over them. We need to weep over the lost. We need to pray for the lost. You know, if you see someone down and out, we don't just say tough luck on them or, oh gosh, what's wrong? We weep for their salvation because we know that salvation brings about this type of change, this renewal within. The renewal of the heart is critical to live as God intends for you to live. To have a hard heart is a telltale sign you are not of God. I see people every day that they'll blaspheme, they'll say something horrific about God or use God's name in vain, or they'll say something awful about someone else, or they'll literally trample on someone to get ahead. That is, to me, the biggest indication that they are unsaved, they are unregenerated, that they need God, amen, or whatever else. And there's so many ways you can look at that, but pray to God that he renews your heart, firstly, by saving you if you haven't been saved. Bible says to work your salvation out with fear and trembling, to believe on Jesus Christ and what he did for you on the cross at Calvary. And if you're backslid, he, he, pray that God calls you back. Pray that he allows you to come back. Pray that he gives you discernment over the, the ways of this world. Pray that he gives you victory over these sins that have got you that have got you in the situation that you're in. We all fall short. Look, I pray every single day. God, God help me to say it correctly. I pray every single day to be repentant before him, that there is no sin. I ask God flat out, Lord, if there is a sin that's dividing me from you, show it to me right now. Search my heart. And you know, it's not easy to pray because I know how imperfect I am. I know, you know, how short-tempered I could be. And I know how uh, I can mope around like anyone else can mope around. But I pray that prayer because I really desire that soft heart. And by the way, this is just extra here, wasn't on the outline. But you know, you have that soft heart and you go to, you know, to a service, you go around the brethren, you will be moved more than you can ever imagine by the testimonies, by the preaching, by the, I mean, you will have a truer sense of worship to God because your heart is soft than anything you can imagine. Secondly, you got to renew your spirit. Titus 3, 5, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. Second Corinthians 4, 16, for which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. Now, when do we get the Holy Spirit? We get the, the Holy Spirit, who's a he, we get him when we're saved. 
we're saved. We are renewed in the spirit. We are, we, we have a peace with God that surpasses all understanding. We now can do what God intends us to do and live how God intends us to live. Not perfect, but for him, which we couldn't have done earlier, as I mentioned, because Adam sinned. Adam sinned. It's hereditary, passed down from every generation. We can't do what God calls us to do. Oh, well, we're saved. Oh, well, we're renewed in the spirit. We have the spirit now. Oh, now that we have the Holy Spirit, we're born again. Now that we have the Holy Spirit, we can live as God wants us to live. The Bible says we are now reconciled to God. We have peace with God. And the Bible also says we're now given over to the ministry of reconciliation, as in helping others have that same peace. And lest we walk around puffed up like we're something special, hey, we're really holy. Unless we put on our tuxedo and walk around and say, oh, we are so holy, you know. It's by God, not by works of righteousness, which we have done. It's nothing we have done. I don't know about you, but the point I got saved, I was wicked and living in the world. The point that the Lord really called me to the ministry, I was just completely broken. I mean, I was at, I was at the most, I would say worst part of my life. I won't say most sinful, but I would say pretty, pretty darn close to most sinful part of my life. God said, yeah, okay, I can use you now. Now you're broken. Now you understand your need for me. Now you understand that it's not by works of righteousness. Now you understand how little you can do. The Bible says that God can't use the proud, but he'll lift up the humble. That's a paraphrase. It's God's mercy to give us a spirit. And the spirit, him, he always points to Jesus. And he is the comforter. The Bible calls him the comforter. What does it mean to comfort? It means to make someone feel better in a time of difficulty. What does it mean to live the Christian life, to run that race where everyone's telling you you're running the wrong direction? It is difficult. And oftentimes it can feel like the more you try to do for God, the more resistance you get. And everything is a challenge. Everything is a snare. Everything is a battle. And the battle is hot. Amen. And you've prayed to God to renew your mind. You're praying for renewal of spirit. You're going to be facing battles. And the comforter is there to comfort you. It's God living within you to comfort you. And we see in 2 Corinthians 4, 16, our body, outward man perishes, our body is dying, our body's decaying, etc. But the inward man is renewed day by day. And that's how you can go through this battle and wake up and maybe even know what you're going to face as you serve the Lord. And you can have a smile on your face and say, hey, I'm renewed inside. My spirit's okay. I mean, there's times lately, even in my spiritual journey where there, they seemed pretty scary, and yet I was fine. I had peace. I was ready to go because of the comforter, because of the Spirit. It is the will and work of God that the Spirit is strong, even though our body is tired. And we see that the Spirit, the reason why we need to pray for the renewal of the Spirit, is that the Spirit and the flesh are at war. <clears throat> Excuse me, Matthew 26, 41. Matthew 26, 41. I'm drinking my coffee here because, you know, okay. All right, Matthew 26, 41. Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Jesus speaks this at a very pivotal time. He's in the garden, Yosemite. He's praying. He's he saying, I'm, I'm terrified. I could die right now. I'm struggling with this because he knew what was to come. The crucifixion was to come. The most brutal death that man has ever faced was to come, that he was going to have to bear the sin of the entire world, past, present, and future, and that he was going to be mocked and ridiculed and beaten to a point where he was unrecognizable, and people were going to stand around and watch like his earthly mother Mary and the disciples, some of them, and so forth. He was going to have to deal with so much pain. And he said, watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. Why? Because disciples are going to run away or fall asleep or something. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. So we realize that we need to be renewed in the spirit because the spirit is willing. But if the flesh has hold of our life, if we're saved and we're willfully ignorant, if we're saved and we're backslid, if we're saved and we're grieving the Holy Spirit, How then can we have the power of God upon us? How then can we have that right spirit within us? How then can the comfort comfort us if all we're doing is spitting in God's face with our behavior, living rebelliously? It's worse, God help me to say this correctly, it is worse to live sinful as a Christian than to live sinful as a natural man in the world. Because as a Christian, you know better. 
you know, as a Christian, you've been brought up better. As a Christian, you have the comforter living within you. And you're saying, okay, God, you made me, you saved me, you gave me this precious gift, but I'll put all that on the side for this little thing that tickles my ears or tickles my eyes or whatever else. Pray to God that you grieve not the Holy Spirit. He is God. You then are grieving God. And pray to God for a rich Holy Spirit conviction to live out the life he has for you. So you see how we get right with God in our heart? We're living totally different than if we, were right with, if we weren't right with God in our heart. If we get right with God in the Spirit and we have that Holy Spirit conviction, we are living totally different. The Spirit, what does the Holy Spirit care about? Not about your appetites. The Holy Spirit cares about salvation. The Holy Spirit cares about lifting the name of Jesus up. The Holy Spirit cares about praising a holy God. These things are completely in direct opposition to what the flesh would do. We are to pray to God for a rich Holy Spirit. You'd be living like people are going to say, what happened to you? You're on fire for God. Well, you prayed for renewal of your heart. You prayed for renewal of the spirit. And finally, you are to pray for renewal of your mind. Romans 12, 2. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Think about this. We are not to be conformed, but transformed. We are not to live like everyone that's running that race in the wrong direction, but we are to be so transformed that we are bold in living for the Lord. We are to renew our mind, our intellect, because that's what God wants us to do, and that's why God made us. To be good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Okay, Ephesians 4, 15 through 23. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. It's about the church body here in Ephesians. This I say, therefore... And testify in the Lord that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind. Remember that vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. We are talking about the heart being the deepest part of them. They're blind in the heart. They're ignorant to what God wants them to do. Verse 19, who being past feeling, they're numb to it. Okay. They're no longer there. The idea is like their conscience has been seared with a hot iron. They're completely numb to it. Having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. But ye have not so learned Christ. If so be that ye have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning the former conversation or behavior the, uh, of the old man there, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. So here Paul in Ephesians 4, 15 through 23, is writing about the point of the church body, that we're all to work together, separate but, but together, right? We each have our own role to live as God wants us to live, to be able to testify in the Lord, to walk not in the vanity of our own minds. And that word vanity doesn't mean like necessarily someone just staring in the mirror and being like, oh, I look good. It means improper use, right? So the heart is deceiving us. The mind is telling us, the intellect is telling us we need this, this, and this. We are completely putting faith on the back burner, if at all. We're not messing with faith. We're just living as our mind and our heart is telling us a natural man wants to do. And guess what happens? We're a poor testimony. We can't do anything. We're living unclean. We're living greedy. It's not good. And guess what happens to you, by the way? You end up confused. You end up perplexed. A famous golfer was recently admitted to gambling a fortune. I mean, he's very, very wealthy. And he gambled all this money. And it begs the question, if he had all this money, and if the world told us that money, if we make that our God, we'll be happy, then why did he let gambling destroy his life? What did he need to gamble for? He didn't, it wasn't like someone down their last dollar. It was a bluegrass song. I had my last dime and I gambled it away or something. But uh, you know, he had all of it and he gambled it. Why? And now as everyone's, he's alienated, he's got all kinds of problems. He's humiliated. What's going on? See, 
as we follow the greediness of the natural mind, we're led to places that destroy us. A famous politician was caught in an affair and he said, you know what, I'll be honest, the ways of God, the, the word of God is there for our own preservation, our own help. Well, yeah, duh. And by the way, when we don't follow it, what do we do? We end up in all these snares. That's what Paul's writing about here. And he's saying, stop that behavior, put that off, put on the new man, right? Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. The natural mind is vain and at war with God and his ways. If an example I've given a hundred times, you get in the water, you get in the ocean water and let yourself just float. You're taken away from where you were standing. If you try to live the best you can in this mind, in this heart, unrenewed, backslid or not saved, you will float away. You will move away from the ways of God. That is the way the world is. The natural mind is darkened by ignorance and given uh, uh, to wickedness and greed. Think about it. How can you, you know, ignorant kind of gets a bad rap. Ignorant just means you don't know, right? Um, I am ignorant to engine repair of a vehicle. I don't know. If you opened up uh, the trunk of a car, you know, I know there's a lot of shade tree mechanics around here. You open up a trunk of a car, somehow you get the lid of that engine open up. I wouldn't know what a piston or cylinder is. I wouldn't know anything, okay? I know where the battery is. That's it. I'm ignorant to it. It doesn't make me a bad person. I'm just ignorant to it, right? Well, the world, they're ignorant to the ways of God. It doesn't mean that they're naturally just like um, want to, you know, they're murderers or something. Because the world often will say, you know, I'm, you know, I give to UNICEF. I, I help old people cross the street. I'm a good person. No, you're ignorant to the ways of God. And what God is saying here through through the Apostle Paul is we need to put off that old man. We need to pray that our intellect be renewed, right? By God. The renewed mind is on the things and ways of God. The renewed mind has peace that is beyond understanding because God, the author, made it to be so. So as we wrap up here, when we look at the renewed mind, the intellect, how we think, the craziest situation for the natural person is actually a testimony and a, and a joy for the renewed mind. Imagine, think of the natural mind in this scenario. You're broke, you're alone, you're forsaken by your friends. You're unable to get your voice heard by anybody, and you seemingly have nowhere to turn in this world. Think of the natural mind. The natural mind would be signaling despair, envy, strife, hatred, which, by the way, are all these works of the flesh. Now think of the renewed mind. You're broke, so is Jesus. You're alone, so is Jesus. You're forsaken, so is Jesus. You're ignored, so is Jesus. Nowhere to turn here in this world? Jesus had that as well. He couldn't even keep the disciples awake. You see, now what this would do in the renewed mind is it would draw you to where God wants you to be, to be thinking about Christ and having a joy in Christ that number one, in your bad circumstance, you have joy and you have peace and Jesus Christ will never leave you nor forsake you. You have that comfort, you have the comforter and you have joy in God because he now has the occasion to show his power through your weakness. God likes to show his power through your weakness. Paul writes about that himself. That when we are weak, God is made strong and that we can actually rejoice in our weakness because it's an opportunity for God to say, show up and show out. And as I've looked in the valley at massive mountains in my life, and there's been a few of them, especially lately, I look at them and I say, that's just an opportunity for God to just completely show out and get the testimony and get the praise and I believe that. I've heard a preacher one time say that God will work when he gets the maximum amount of praise. And I don't know if that's exactly true, but that's somewhat true that we can certainly look at our broken situation and say, yeah, God's going to get praise from that. And the natural man has no hope. So they're, they're, they're like worried because they're in this bad situation and their whole hope was yoked up in the world. And now their hope is gone. And the renewed mind, the renewed man, they have a joy in what's to come. So you can praise God for what's happening now. You can praise God that it's, you're living Christ-like. You can praise God as the disciples did, that you were worthy to suffer for Christ. You can praise God that God's going to show up and show out and give a testimony. And you can praise God for what's to come, which is going to be so much better in heaven when you have your reward. The renewed mind is joyful even in life's worst, worst circumstances. The renewed mind is at peace in any circumstance. This is this idea of wanting nothing, the, the biblical state of not coveting, not being yoked up in the world, but wanting nothing. So you can actually live life freely. 
you can be free from the sin and bondage of the world. Because when you have that renewed mind, your things, your, your mind is not on the things of the world. I don't know how people live in the world because my mind would constantly be driving me to a point of despair, looking at what so-and-so had or what so-and-so was doing or what this was happening or that was happening. But I can be at peace knowing that I serve a sovereign God. So let's piece this all together here. A renewed heart, loving what God loves, living as God would have you to live. A renewed spirit, God living within you, guiding and comforting you in life's journey. A renewed mind, thinking as God would have you to, being joyful no matter the circumstance. You see, as we pray to God for that threefold renewal, we are given that soft heart. We are given that Holy Spirit that is enriched within us. And we are given a mind that is on the things and ways of God that allows us to both do what God would have us to do and also have a joy that surpasses all understanding, no matter the circumstance. Please, friend, today, pray to God for that threefold renewal, that he renew your heart, that he renew your spirit, and that he renew your mind. Thank you for listening. Take care. God bless and amen.